companies are starting to realize that business isn't done between companies, that business is done between people, and that at the end of the day, business is personal. And so by focusing on areas like customer advocacy, it allows them to establish long-term relationship. So if somebody transitions to a new job, a new position, that you are one of the key elements that they have, a part of their toolkit that they bring with them onto the next organization as well. Welcome to the State of Customer Storytelling Podcast, brought to you by Testimonial Hero, the podcast that is all about helping you as a B2B marketing leader get the download on the most current practices and tactics related to customer storytelling. Why? So you can make customer stories your competitive advantage and hit your revenue goals, your marketing goals faster. My guest today is none other than David Coates. David is the Director of Customer Marketing at Forder. Previously, he was the Director of Customer Marketing at Iron Mountain. So he's done a lot in the customer marketing space. He's extremely passionate about exploring ways to spur collaboration and, and thinking on how to bring value uh, from the customer's perspective um, to you know, your business and just better understanding how to add value and capture you know customer stories, capture customer insights, and build those stronger relationships. David, welcome to the show. Sam, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Absolutely. And just to kick things off, you know, I think let's talk about customer advocacy broadly. I think you know, in many ways, we're sort of in the early days of customer advocacy, but it's also something that's been going on for, you know, since the start of marketing in many respects. So so maybe it's like a renaissance, but but it's evolving quickly. In your opinion, what is customer advocacy all about? And, and why does it really matter? Why should we as marketers be caring about this and paying more attention to this more than ever? Yeah, great question, Sam. And it's definitely the way to open up the podcast, right? I think what you're seeing really is a convergence of a number of different things in the last few years. Um, I, I think when you look at the evolution of B2C companies and even social media, customers have had a more active role in working with organizations to kind of really shape everything from how the brand is represented publicly to how the product works, right? And I think for a long time, uh, companies on the B2B and the B2C side separated out consumers. So it was like you, when you literally were driving to work and you might be, you know, um, listening to the radio and, and listening to like consumer advertising or you would like on your phone, not driving, obviously, but on your phone, checking stuff out. You were treated one way. As soon as you walk through the office doors into your office space, you were treated completely differently, you know. And so I think what's been interesting through like LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter is that BC brands have had a much closer relationship with their consumers than they did in the past. And I think what you've seen in the last few years is that consumer behavior and expectations start to bleed over into the B2B space. And I think one of the big driving factors was that a lot of uh, SaaS services or software companies who were on annual contracts, they realized that they couldn't wait until month 11 to go back to the company customer and say, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Customer, will you resign, right? So I think what you're seeing really is this confluence of people bringing their whole selves to work, right? Where they expect to have a relationship with the brands that they trust, whether that is a big B2B company or a B2C company. Um, and that also companies have started to realize, you know, it's much more expensive to get a new customer in the door than to have an existing customer that you can retain and build that long-term relationship. And the other thing I would say as well, right, is that companies are starting to realize that business isn't done between companies, that business is done between people, and that at the end of the day, business is personal. And so by focusing on areas like customer advocacy, it allows them to establish long-term relationship that isn't just about that current role or that current company, but you hope you almost get this lifetime relationship, right? So if somebody transitions to a new job, a new position, that you are one of the key elements that they have, a part of their toolkit that they bring with them onto the next organization as well. So I kind of that's kind of a long meandering point to get to my main hypothesis that customer advocacy is really about how do you build that affinity with your customers that you understand what their journey is and that you're able to really bring an understanding of their motivations 
into the way that you conduct business uh, and that ultimately you're able then to turn that back out into the marketplace. We'll talk a little bit about storytelling and other stuff as well, but kind of a long answer, but that that's my, my view on customer advocacy. I love that you brought up the convergence of B to, you know, B to C and sort and it's such a good point because I think, you know, we can sort of get a, a preview of what's kind of coming into B2B by looking at, you know, what, what were the major, you know, ground swells in B2C, you know, now and a couple of years ago. And um, just thinking of like online shopping and reviews, uh, that obviously being one of them, and, and which I think transitions us to the next question is like the customer stories segment of, of customer mm-hmm. advocacy. What are you seeing in terms of, you know, the importance of customer storytelling and, and, and B2B and, you know, maybe how that's, mm-hmm. you know, accelerating or, or, you know, just evolving? Yeah, it's a really great question, Sam, and something that we're, you know, looking at all the time. I, I think in many respects, if you go back into human evolution, right, uh, storytelling has been a foundational part of the human experience for thousands of years. It's how a common way that language and shared experiences is, is, is created and shared, right? So I think in many respects, you know, companies have used technology in the last 30 or 40 years to kind of help to create systems and operationalize business. But at the end of the day, humans relate best when it's about shared experiences or shared stories. So I think more and more companies are realizing that storytelling is absolutely central to not not only uh, what the customer experience is, but also as importantly, what their employees experience as well, right? And that you want to create a shared sense of, value and a shared culture and companies are realizing that that value and culture doesn't just reside within the organization but it extends and should include partners and customers and other key stakeholders as well that makes a ton of sense and um in terms of a strategy around this you know stories i think a lot of marketing leaders say like okay like i wanted you know i i get it i i see this shift coming that it's not it's not enough to just you know, do traditional marketing, right? Like you need the, I think the, the customer stories to kind of just compete at the level that, you know, companies like, for example, Ford are, 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 you know, doing it. How does one kind of, you know, get started there from a, from a strategic perspective? Like if I'm a marketer and I'm like, all right, I'm, I want to become current in our practices around customer storytelling. How do I start to set a strategy there? Do you have any perspective or, or tips? How do, how do you think about it? Yeah. And so I think, you know, one thing that really, one point that really illustrates kind of how important storytelling is, and, you know, you mentioned video, obviously there's peer reviews and lots of other elements that I would say tie into customer storytelling, customer advocacy, is there was a study done a couple of years ago now by CSO Insights that looked at where do people make their buying decisions and how do they make their buying decisions? And that research showed they make about they, they're about 70% of the way through their buying process before they even talk to sales. So when you think about it, people doing research, right? They're going out and they're looking at reviews online. You know, they're looking at video. They're looking at all these different sources of information. They're speaking to their peers. They're speaking to other trusted uh, sources, might be analysts, et cetera, right? Industry analysts. So that's really important when you think about yourself as being a, a business leader that by the time that you might be aware of the RFP that's come into you, that 70% of the work has already been done on the back end where they've been prospects have been researching. They want to make sure they're feeling informed because for so many of, 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 of people, it's time consuming to change vendors, right? It, it's expensive to change vendors. There's change management organization that needs to take place. So companies are realizing, especially with strategic decisions, you don't, you can't take it lightly, right? And, and that this isn't something that you want to be switching out 18 months from now. So a lot of that work is being done way before sales is engaged. So if I was a strategic leader, I think looking at customer advocacy, I think one of the things you have to do is really make an assessment of what do you want to use customer advocacy for? And I think one of the interesting things you mentioned at the start, in many respects, the industry still is in its infancy, right? I mean, customer advocacy has been around for a while. It's been more defined in the last five to 10 years. Uh, there's still a lot of work being done to try and kind of get a common even lexicon around it. You know, wh- how do you talk about this? I think if you look at so many different organizations and like my journey, I didn't go to school for customer advocacy, right? I literally ended up coming into this space because I loved working with customers. 
And I think that's true for most people in this space. Um, it's not something that they studied at school. It's literally they had a passion around it and they kind of built their tool set accordingly based on their experience, their passion, and the exposure they've had at the organizations. So, you know, if I was a business leader, I think where I would focus is, am I looking at this as a way to support my goals around retention? Am I looking at it as an opportunity to go and drive cross the upsell? Am I looking at actually to uh, create a better lifetime experience, right? And mapping that customer journey, et cetera, as well. So I think it's really important that as a business leader that you're talking to uh, the product teams, you're talking to the sales teams, you're talking to obviously to leadership and really figuring out, okay, what are our primary business goals for the next 12 to 18 months? And how do customers tie into that, right? Um, and I think, you know, once, once you've done that, it, it's really important. It sounds simple, Sam, but it's really important that you actually go and talk to some customers. So often in a, in a, even a marketing role, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about personas and about messaging and about like all the different ways we can present our products into the marketplace. But very few marketers actually really spend time talking to customers unless it's at a trade show elsewhere, right? So I almost think, you know, as much as you can, it's going and spending some time and really figuring out what drives customers and what motivates them personally. And I'm not talking from a business perspective, right? But actually thinking about what are they personally motivated by? What are they trying to achieve within their role as well, right? Because that's going to help you get to the essence of their story. I would also say another great source, and before you do anything else, is actually go and talk to your customer success team. Because at the end of the day, those are the folks who are on the phones day in, day out with the, with the um, with the customers. They're often one of the main interfaces back into the organization, whether that's the analytics teams or the engineering teams or the product teams. So they've got a really good handle on what's going on within the customer base as well and can actually help you identify and match up. Okay, this is what the organization is doing. This is what we're seeing from customers. And this is how you can potentially align uh, the two. So as you kind of build out your strategy, you talk to the customers, you talk to customer success. And then I would obviously advocate for at least hiring one person whose sole job is focused on customer marketing or customer advocacy. It is a, it is a very different set of skills, right? I mean, you have to be able to be a storyteller yourself. You have to be able to write. You have to be able to link back in with other parts of the marketing organization, whether that's demand. You have to be somebody who can problem solve as well. So so I think a de dedicated role is a really foundational piece of building out a, a strategy for including customer advocacy within your marketing toolkit effectively. That makes a ton of sense. And I love how you brought up the prospects are 70% of the way through the buying process before they even talk to sales. I think the sort of the, impl the implementation and the accessibility of your customer's stories becomes paramount with that in mind, um, right? Because like, it's not, you know, people want to self-serve. So what have you, what have you guys done at, uh, you all done at Forder to kind of make sure, okay, like we're telling these great customer stories and um, whether they're video, you know, text, you know, written, uh, and we're actually making sure that prospects can find them on their own. Because I think that is like the kind of, irony sometimes is it's very easy to devote a lot of um, time and, and, and budget to creating customer stories, but then they're sort of, you know, buried somewhere on the website or, or whatnot, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point, Sam. And, and in full disclosure, I think we're still on our own journey there. We just recently hired a new head of digital demand. We've also hired a new head of content, right, in the last, in the last two or three months. Because I think you're right. I think it's one of the biggest challenges is you can go out and create all this great content and it's easy to say, all right, we've got it on the website, job done. I think, um, you know, what's really important is having a strategy then to say, okay, we've got this great content, be it reviews or be it video testimonials, whatever else it might be. How do we then make sure that we're using it through digital, through SEO or through PPC, you know, or how are we using it? for our social strategy? How are we also using it as importantly to help support our customers? Because at the end of the day, it's their story that we're telling, right? Um, and so, you know, I think um, in, in many respects, it's unless, unless you understand the motivation there, it's gonna make it much more difficult to tell those stories. So I don't think I answered your question, but- <laughs> No, I think, I mean, you're right. I mean, there's no magic bullet. And from what I'm hearing from what you're saying is like, it needs to be a priority and, and we all have to kind of 
think, uh, I guess, a bit more in a more sophisticated, nuanced way these days versus like, okay, like, check the box, we have a customer's page, you know, you know, it's, or I mean, honestly, that's a really good start, right? A lot of companies may not even have, you know, a really updated, dedicated customer's page, it might just be kind of haphazard. Yeah, and I, and I think the other thing as well is, you know, it's really understanding what's in it for the customer. And I go back to really understanding what their own personal journey is, right? And, and a lot of companies do invest in doing customer journey mapping. So, you know, what is the experience for a customer after they've signed the contract and they're onboarding? What does that communication look like throughout the course of the relationship? And obviously what you hope to do is way before the renewal, you've got to a point of really good understanding and relationship that the renewal is hopefully more auto automatic and that you actually look at more at kind of crossing up so in that point, right? And building a stronger relationship with that organization. I think when it comes to customer stories, if you understand what the individual's motivation is, right, then that makes it much more easy to go and ask for that, whether it's a video or, or reviews, whatever, whatever else it might be. And I think um, one of the things that we've tried to do as well is to really say, okay, we know that our customers are in a pretty complex area of the business, right? That they're not necessarily front and center all the time for the organization, but the work they're doing has major impacts on the company. And so the market we're in is around e-commerce, you know, fraud and abuse. And so what we try and do is we think about the customer story and the advocacy piece is how are we helping our customer tell their story better within the company? And you, you're right, right? Um, video really now has become such a predominant way to tell that, especially in the age of COVID, where you know you used to use a lot of live events and trade shows and conferences to help to share that customer story. Obviously, uh, that really went away for 18 months. It's coming back now, which is great. But the video has become such an important medium in all its forms, whether it's uh, more informal, like we're doing, you know, people are much more used now to seeing less highly produced video like this as standard, right? Um, but there's still a really important place for those really nice, high quality uh, corporate videos as well. So I think, I think it's really about going out and showcasing the customer success in the different assets, right? Um, and the video has been obviously the clearest, easiest one. Uh, and then figuring out, okay, when you've got the customers buying and they can see the see the way the story is being presented, how do you then use it um, across the various marketing channels, et cetera, as well? Mm, yeah, I want to double click into that a bit. You know, tell me more, like in your opinion, like what do you get with video when it comes to customer stories that you you don't get in you know other mediums? Sure. So, I mean, obviously with video, you could still see the person, right? Even if it's a nicely produced, a high quality video with B-roll uh, and, and uh, graphics, et cetera, you're still hearing from that person directly. And I think that's the most important part, right? Is that, you know, written case studies are fine, but it, it's really static on a page. Uh, I think the beauty of video is that it does allow you to uh, create a single asset. It tells a story. You can make bring energy into it through music and, and other graphics. Um, but it also gives you is something that is a really great core asset that can then be repurposed across so many different platforms, right? So it's interesting now, I know the guidance for doing like a, a customer video is, you know, 90 seconds to two minutes at the most, right? But that doesn't mean to say you can't then use it as a 15 second promo for um, a webinar or that you can incorporate it as part of a nurture flow for your demand campaign where you take like a 30 second uh, sound bite. The other thing that we've been doing a lot with uh, video is asking similar questions to a variety of different customers and then really looking at compilation videos around key areas that we know that uh, prospects are particularly interested in, right? Around key pain points. That's been super valuable as well because it, what it allows you to do is to get different talking heads all talking about a common issue, a common pain point uh, that we believe resonate best uh, with, with prospects and can help the sales team, again, bring some outside voices, bring some fresh perspective to um, help accelerate that conversation. That's such a good tip around compilations. And um, I think especially with, with compilations, you have such a number of people, a number of faces, they can just deliver a lot of social proof, a lot of you know, truthiness and trustworthiness. 
really quickly. And uh, yeah, just having the, there's, you know, multiple people, even in like a 60 second video with five, you know, known people, it's just like, boom, like awesome social proof. Well, and also the other thing as well, right? I, I think the thing to recognize is we're completely, completely operating in a much more inter interconnected and global world. So the reason I also like compilations is it allows you to reflect a much broader and diverse uh, group of customers as well, right? So whether that's um, ethnically diverse, geographically diverse, experientially diverse as well. So when we think about, you know, an asset for global as well, having a more diversity, I think is really important too. That's a, that's a super key point as well. And um, you also mentioned like uh, sales there. Um, how do you see the, the relationship between, you know, customer marketing, customer advocacy, or, and just customer storytelling in the sales team? I guess like, Really, I guess the question is like, what sort of principles make for a great relationship between customer advocacy and sales? Sure. And actually, what I want to do is I want to take a step back before we even talk about sales, Sam, because I think it's easy to look at that side, right? And what social, social proof or advocacy becomes is the creation of an inventory or library of assets that the sales teams can use. But actually, I think it starts much earlier in the sales process. And this is the handoff, I think, with marketing, right? In that customer advocacy has such a key role to play within the demand funnel, whether that's top of the funnel, mark building awareness, whether that's more mid funnel when you've already kind of got those uh, marketing qualified leads in and you're looking to nurture and hand them off to the sales team so that they can go and actually start to accelerate some of those deals, or whether it's bottom of the funnel where you're actually looking to, to close those deals, right? And so from my perspective, um, the customer advocacy is really a key part or should be a key part of any company's demand strategy. So whether that is looking at video testimonials we just talked about or use cases as part of the nurture program um, that when you're starting to build that awareness, whether it's actually having a customer come and talk about a specific use case or pain point at a round table or webinar, right? I mean, that's such an important piece of storytelling and advocacy to an audience that may be slightly familiar with your organization, know they have a pain point and are looking for, for other like-minded companies or other experiences, which is relevant to them and say, oh yeah, okay, we can, we can learn from that and we can apply that. And, the, and again, I think as you focus in on more like account-based marketing as well, it's about how do you bring customers in to do targeted workshops, et cetera, where maybe it's a small group a group of prospects in a given market or with a given issue that are really there to share and learn from a customer who's already been through that, right? So I would say even before you get to the sales organization, customer advocacy has such an important role in making sure that the leads that you're passing over to the sales team understand who you are, understand the value that you can drive from a customer perspective, and they've already got a sense of the value that you can drive for them in their role within their team and for their organization. And that's really that's really important, that hierarchy, right? Because at the end of the day, business is personal. And that when people are evaluating potential vendors, they're looking at it from their own view, right? They're looking at it, is this company one that I can work with? And is this company the one that's going to help me demonstrate my value within the organization as well? So I, I think even before you get to sales, Sam, it's really thinking about how you bring customer advocacy, whether that's peer reviews or stories or or getting to speak at events or workshops. How do you bring customers into 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 that into that setting as well? Before we talk about sales, I don't know if you you've got any thoughts about that. That is such a key point. So tell um and I guess how okay how 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 do you recommend you know is it just okay figuring out where the gaps are like okay, like here's our strategy, here's our prior, here are our priorities around our demand gen and go to market and then like figuring out where the gaps are and then kind of saying, okay, if we wanna move into this market segment, do we have the customer stories to support it? Yes, no, we don't. And then it's sort of, you know, moving from there. Or yeah, how do you kind of make that happen? Yeah, it's a combination, right? So, so many organizations, you know, now really focus on on providing large scale marketing campaigns, even B2B, right? And so part of it is really, you know, how do you create that collaborative environment where you are bringing the key stakeholders within the marketing team, whether that's digital or content or social or, or, or comms, also the table will say, okay, we're launching a, a campaign around X. What do we have in terms of content? What do we have in terms of 
the customer stories to help support that, right? And so sometimes, no doubt, there's going to be gaps. And I think that's where then, you know, you go back to your customer base a little bit and take a look and say, okay, from our relationships we have, where do we know we're in good standing with the customer? Where do we think that we've got the relationship that we can go back and maybe ask for some level of testimonial, whether it's written or video or, or reviews, et cetera, to go and maybe fill those gaps and make sure that when we launch the campaign, we have all the different assets in place, whether that's, again, the validation from the marketplace uh, through analysts or through customers. So, you know, it, it's definitely trying to take a more holistic view to how marketing is supporting the overall goals of the organization. And that really ties back into, into the campaign element. So, yeah, that's that's a great point. And as you brought up like identifying which customers to feature, right, which seems simple, you know, but it's actually, I think, very complex, especially at companies of larger size. How do you actually, you know, figure out you know, if you're a marketer and you're like, great, I'm going to do, you know, do these customer stores. How do you actually figure out which customer you are going to to ask to, you know, appear in the story? Yeah, I think there's a quantitative and a qualitative side to this, right? So I think so many companies now, and we're definitely on this path as well, they have health scores for customer accounts, right? So they will include everything from NPS scores or customer satisfaction scores as part of an annual survey um, to really understand kind of, you know, where they are in terms of standing with that account. Uh, lots of companies will also integrate customer service tickets or support desk tickets as well into that equation so they can identify folks maybe who've called in with a problem and, and address that, but also folks who've called in who are um, super happy with the service. And they can also be down to you know um, simple adoption, like are they members of a customer community, for example, as well, right? So there are, there are a number of different factors uh, that play into kind of identifying what you would identify as your raving fans, uh, folks who you know are you know super high NPS score and would be very likely to recommend you to a peer or colleague, right? So that's definitely a good starting point. I think also so many organizations through their customer success team, they have a really good handle on the overall standing of accounts. Um, and we'll also be doing either executive business reviews or quarterly business reviews or annual business reviews and can really kind of give you a good sense of the overall uh, health of that account and whether it's the right time to actually be thinking about, you know, how, if we're in very good standing, what value we're trying to drive for this account and the individual. Um, and is it the right time to go and actually ask them to be involved in some level of advocacy? Um, and what, what we do increasingly is we, I, I work very closely with the CS team and we have what we call promoting the partnership. So in advance of uh, quarterly business reviews or the annual annual business review, I'll talk to the CS team and say, you know, hey, customer X, you know, seems to be in a really good spot. What do you think we can potentially do with them in the coming year based on our goals? Um, and we actually will include within the, the business review a dedicated section to promoting the partnership, which will have everything from participating in a video testimonial to joining the customer advisory board to participating in workshops. And we don't obviously put everything in front. What we try and do is tailor that approach for the account so that when the CS member makes an ask for the customer, it's very clear what we're hoping to be able to do with the value to the customer for themselves and the organization. And so then making that ask within that quarter or the following quarter, it's already been kind of identified and it's expected. And that makes the ask much easier as well. That is that. So I want to drill down into that. So if I'm understanding you correctly, because that, that makes a ton of sense. So basically, like when you you're, you're thinking a quarter ahead, at least, and you're sort of socializing, hey, here's a menu of different options. And would any of these you know, be appealing to you? Maybe like next quarter. Yeah, tell, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, so we know that's for some customers, and it's interesting, right? Like as you mentioned, doing this for quite a while, for almost almost ten years now. And so you also have to kind of look at a behavioral level as well, right? That people, when they come into a work every day, they're motivated to do a great job, right? But they're also looking at a couple of different factors that will will drive their their behavior too. So there's no doubt that, given that we're in a hybrid world, that lots have changed uh, as well. That Customers are always looking for a way to be able to demonstrate the value that they're, they're delivering to their organization, right? It's a point of pride, but also a point of differentiation. So if you think about it, uh, we've had a number of customers in the last two or three months actually be promoting their organization. 
because of the work that they're doing, because of the value that they're driving. And, and part of it is based on the, the work that we're doing with them, right? So that's that whole move up idea, right? Moving up in their organization is one potential motivation. We also know it's a very dynamic marketplace out there, right? That people are looking for their next opportunity, whether it's within their organization to move laterally or within a different organization. So that's that whole concept of moving out, right? So, you, you know, LinkedIn, you, you find there's tons of jobs going um, and it's a very dynamic market. So, so people are also looking to best position themselves in the marketplace in that way as well. And then the final piece is that some customers just love what they do. It's like one of the reasons I'm talking to you, right, Sam? I just love doing customer marketing. And I love the opportunity, and, and thank you for inviting me on today, but I love the opportunity to go and talk about customer marketing, customer advocacy, and what it means, right? There are lots of folks who just are passionate and want to connect with their peers and share ideas. So that's that whole concept of shout out as well. So move up, move out, and shout out are kind of three pillars that I look at as I think about my customers and what we might want to engage with them to help tell their story personally. So that's always a, a factor we can look at each uh, QBR. And then the other portion is, and what's good for the business, right? There might be something that they want to promote internally, that they've got a big initiative that they're underway, that being able to produce a video testimonial is a great way to be able to socialize something internally to say, hey, you know, we've been working on this for the last 18 months. Here is a two minute overview of what we've been able to achieve. And it doesn't have to be something that they produce internally. We can fund that, right? But it, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's an asset that they, it's their story and we're effectively along for the ride. Yeah, I love that. And so essentially, it sounds like best practices might be, or like the future of practices, really, like the future of this is, is, you know, not just that one, you know, 90 second, you know, video, it's it's the, maybe the 90 second version for, you know, for, for your company. And then maybe there's a dedicated, you know, 90 second version that's really just for them and is way more personal mm -hmm. and highlights them even more. Mm -hmm. That I think, yeah, I'm curious what you think about that and like actually like kind of like gifting them like, okay, here's your dedicated special version, like where it's like 100% about you. Like this is like basically like, you know, a career promo, career sizzle reel for that customer. A thousand percent, Sam. In fact, we've actually got a couple of customers, you know, who have really understood the power of advocacy from their perspective, right? And so, we, you know, we talked about move up, move out, shout out you could potentially be doing all three at the same time, right? I mean, you know, as you think about your career, you, you are looking at different ways, at different stages of or maybe a five-year horizon. And of course, every horizon got blew up in the last couple of years, right? But fundamentally, you could be looking to, how do I get promotion while you're also looking to like, oh, it's a really cool market. How I'm also looking two, three years further down the line to go and find my new opportunity, right? And we've actually got a couple of customers who've really figured out, hey, you guys do a really nice job, Falter. Here's some stuff that I'd be willing to do because I really want, really want to build my profile. So we've got a, customer, a couple of customers who they want to go and speak at industry conferences. They want the opportunity to go and participate in like customer advisor boards and other types of peer networking groups because they see it as a way to build their visibility, but also to kind of build more experience and knowledge and connections. Um, and so, yeah, we've definitely had a couple of customers who, you know, have really worked closely with us and done video and, and spoken at trade shows and conferences. And, and we've almost been an extension of their marketing capability for themselves, right? That makes a ton of sense. And so kind of just to summarize this whole, you know, section before we kind of move on and finish up, I think, you know, from my perspective, I'm hearing like, really, you know, first of all, like start, really start the conversation, you know, early, right? Like if you need a testimonial, um, you know, a video testimonial next month, it's not, you know, necessarily like, you know, it, it can certainly happen, but it, in ideally, like you're socializing it like a quarter and you're really understanding, yeah. taking the time to understand them as a person, their goals, and how can you make it a two-way exchange of value for them, you know, in terms of, you know, their mm. career progression and, you know, whether it's uh, just giving them an awesome promo piece that they can use, showing, making them an example of, you know, best practices within their industry, and I think that's also where video kind of ties back in as well is because like, you know, it's, it's a lot, it's pretty cool to have an awesome video uh, about you, you know, w especially, you know, in many cases, well produced that you can then share on your LinkedIn and et cetera. Yeah. The other thing I would say as well, Sam, right. It, it's really important from marketing leaders and business leaders out there to think about customer advocacy, not as a discrete series of activities, 
but as a relationship that you look to build connectivity through. And what I mean by that, right, is um, we're now getting back into being able to do trade shows and conferences, right? Definitely great to have customers who are coming to willing to speak to prospects on the booth or, you know, doing speaking sessions or will come to an event. But I also think it's really important that as a marketing team, you don't lose that opportunity to also say, okay, what else can we do with this platform? What else can we do with this venue? And I think video is a great example of something that is super ubiquitous, right? So that if you are doing a customer event, right, you should be setting up a video booth to go and grab like four or five customers there to do like 90 second talking heads answering four or five questions. Tie it back into the campaigns again, right? You know what's coming up in the calendar year on the two or three big themes that you want to hit. Have some questions prepared that allows you to go and capture that video across all three uh, potential campaigns at the same time, right? Trick, um, approvals can be tricky, absolutely. So maybe you want to do a waiver in advance, maybe you do it afterwards. But I think even being able to look at different venues and then say, okay, how do we apply video in that instance? It could be a customer advisory board, right? How do you go and set up um, a little video booth to go and get some customer testimonials from your advisory members? There's so many different platforms and ways that you can go and create multiple different assets from the same venue that um, you don't lose the opportunity. That's, it's such a timely point with you know, in-person events coming back uh, more and more. And yeah, I, I want to kind of underscore for our listeners, um, a, a booth can be as simple as a, you know, if you're in your hotel suite getting, you know, a video crew and, you know, rearranging, you know, moving a little bit of furniture so you have a very clean uh, background. And when when David's saying video booth, you know, it, it's more, it's not um you know, a literal booth that you need to like worry about necessarily. It's more of just like functionally having a easy place where like exactly like David said, you can just grab a customer, you know, for five or 10 minutes, ask them, you know, four to six questions. And then, you know, boom, you have that, you know, footage capture. Yeah, exactly. The other thing I would say as well, right, Sam, is we talked about talking heads and doing them individually and also doing broader like reels as well. The other thing I think is really important is, you know, how do you kind of create sizzle reels from events and various things, which include some customer talking head, but also bring a lot of energy. Because one of the other things I would say is we see it all the time. We've got kids, you know, the sense of FOMO, right? People don't want to miss out. And I think if you do end up producing some really nice, high quality assets, whether it's, you know, 30 second uh, social stuff or the full like two minute corporate video case it is. What's great about that is it then makes it super compelling when you go and speak to other customers like, hey, we would like to do something similar with you. What do you think? And having that library of resources or assets you can draw from to go and entice people it also ties into that FOMO element as well, right? We see that it's highly reduced. You see that it's about them. It's not about promoting your company so much, right? Then that we found that to be a really great way to be able to set people's minds at ease, to get people excited. And then also as importantly, to provide that evidence, that proof, so that when they go back to corporate or legal and say, hey, we want to get approval to do something similar, they've got some examples that they can share within the organization that will help to make that approval process a little easier too. Yeah, and approvals I think can be such a key point you know anything that you can share and how any tips around navigating those you know legal approvals with you know your customer stories sure so i think uh there's a couple of things to consider right timing's important so think about it where you are in the customer life cycle right coming up to renewals etc is often not necessarily the best time to ask for video or whatever else it might be, but also it's good opportunity to arm your customer success team or your sales team with, hey, we know you're going to negotiation on this. We know price is always going to come up. Um, as part of that discussion, if it comes down to you know pricing issue, can we ask for different assets, customer advocacy assets, whether that's video or reviews, et cetera, right? So it's, that's always a time that you can go back and ask. I would say also don't look at it holistically because it is much more difficult to get external approval, no doubt, right? So getting that nice flashy sizzle reel or the other two minute corporate video, you know, it does take a lot longer. What I would also look at as well is other ways you can generate video content that could be used for internal purposes and for sales purposes, right? And there's important differentiation. 
there's often times when the sales team is going to speak to a prospect, which is in more of a closed meeting, that you could potentially have some video assets uh, available that would be for internal use only. Now, the challenge is, you know, you've got to be able to manage that because obviously when a sales team gets onto really good assets, then they want to be able to share it with the world, right? Um, but I think, you know, in lieu of getting that full approval for it to be used on social, et cetera, I think it's also worth saying, okay, which of these customers can we go back potentially with right now and get approval for internal usage and not external usage, right? I, I would also say you mentioned legal. Uh, it's not just legal. It's also their corporate comms team as well, right? Because they also want to be make sure the loop, because at the end of the day, their primary responsibility is making sure that they're protecting their brand and logo usage and everything else. So I think I think uh, that's super important. And then the final piece I would say in terms of getting legal approval, um, I'm cheating a little bit here, Sam. It's one of the things that we all struggle with as marketers is the salesperson is trying to beat the deadline at the end of the quarter. They've got the MSA, the services agreement in front of the customer uh, to get them to sign it. And then, of course, the issue around the marketing addendum always comes up, right? And invariably, that's one of the things that the sales teams will redline and strike straight through, right? I think, you know, in getting the deal done, that's fine. But what you do miss out is that opportunity then to get some of the customer advocacy work, whether that's press releases or videos or reviews, you lose some of that opportunity to get that stuff locked in at the start of the contract, right? So uh, I would also say it's part of that sales enablement piece to actually work more closely with the sales team, say, hey, look, we understand most of you can't get all of these within the contract but we would love to be able to do a customer testimonial video six months after deployment, as long as performance is at X level. And we'd love for them to do a peer review, whether it's on Gartner or G2, which is anonymized, which is easier for a lot of customers to do. And it's still really good proof, right? It's still part of the story that they can share externally. Uh, and we know that reviews are in increasingly an important way that folks are doing their research in that 70% of that work prior to the sales process. That's such a good point. And, you know, you, it's one of those things where, you know, you can get the tentative agreement and like, obviously you're not going to, you know, call in that, you know, review or that testimonial in the, in the rare case that, um, you know, it, whatever reason, like they didn't go perfectly, but it only makes that, you know, the conversation easier when you kind of, you know, started earlier. Exactly. The other thing I would say as well, right, is think about it also as a human relationship. You don't go in and immediately establish trust, right? It takes, trust takes time and building relationships takes time, right? So um, we talked a lot about video today, but I think it's also important to understand that you can take a customer along on a journey. And, and as long as you're showing that value and as long as you're kind of really sh showing that you're there to be a partner and, it, and it's not just a vendor relationship, I think it's fine to bring a customer along on a journey, right? So this is where the advocacy piece comes in. There is much really a community or a user group that would be relevant to a customer to participate in. Maybe it's a customer advisor board that you get them signed up to, up to so that they actually get to engage with executives and other customers. Uh, and at that point, then it's starting to say, okay, we have a better relationship with this organization, with this individual. We've kind of built that relationship of trust. Now, actually asking for that video or that act of advocacy is a little bit easier because you've got the relationship in place already, right? So you, maybe you don't lead up with a video straight away. Maybe there is a reference call or there's a review that you'd like to get posted on online. That's mostly a much easier ask initially than to ask for some something with a video, which we know is you know a little bit higher production, definitely, and then also takes more review cycles and stuff. I would say that's maybe most, most something you you ask for a little bit later in the relationship. That's a great point. It's like it's. Just like any relationship, it's a stair step sort of approach. It, you know, you don't have to, you know, make the the huge ask right away. Um, yeah. The the last thing I want to ask you about before we wrap up here is, you know, kind of measurement and you know ROI and, and everything as it pertains to, you know, I think specifically customer stories. Uh, I was actually I saw in a Slack group uh, that I'm in for customer marketing, uh, young a woman asked the question, which I thought was great. So I'll just kind of ask it to you, but it was like. My executive team, you know, wants to understand the, what's the, you know, ROI or like the measurement of the customer stories that we're doing, how should I best, you know, basically tell them. And I, I think this is interesting that like a macro point, cause like also a lot of the executive teams are way more flexible on this. Cause like to a certain extent, oh, like the, uh, it, sometimes it just, it makes sense. Like to, there's like a implicit, you know, just uh you know, understanding that like more social proof that's relevant to your, 
you know, the right personas is always going to have a net positive, you know, approach at the same time, you know, depending on how much you're investing, obviously, you know, you may in likely are going to have to, you know, justify it, you know, so yeah, I'm curious, any last tips you have that either for that, you know, that person that we can, you know, maybe pass on to her or just in general about this, you know, measurement and ROI topic. And and I tell you, Sam, when I talk to other practitioners and people get into this space, this is the number one topic that always comes out. How do you show your value back to the organization, right? Um, and I think it's been a challenge traditionally for customer marketing to do that. So I'm not going to lie to you. I use a model that Serious Decisions really introduced, and I'm going to talk through it a little bit. I think I think it's kind of will be of interest. But I think bottom line is. How does your work tie back into the company goals? And we talked about right at the start, right? That unless you're aligned around the business's objectives, you're going to have a hard time proving your value. So what I would say, and this is this is a serious decisions model, is think about showing value based on four key layers or four elements. One is around readiness. And I think too often what happens is people want to skip to activity straight away, right? They want to actually go and do stuff. But I think the readiness piece includes some due diligence around some of those conversations we started at the the top, right? Go and talk to some customers. Go and engage with the customer success team. Go and figure out, okay, what information do we have within our CRM, whether that's Salesforce, whatever else, right? How do I integrate with our marketing automation platform, whether that's, you know, HubSpot or Marketo? Figure out some of that fundamental foundational stuff, because unless you know where the organization needs you pointed, and how you're then going to be able to track and automate some of the work that you're doing, you have a really hard time further down the line, right? So that, that's that readiness piece. Next, once you've got that defined, you kind of got a good sense of where the organization needs you to be pointed and what your customers uh, are, are aligned around, right? Then it's around activity. So for me, it's everything from, you know, how do we go on next relationships with our customers through stuff like advisor boards or executive advisor boards, or we've got a friends of Porter program for our customers, right? So it, it's really about kind of understanding kind of and activating customers in a way that they want to be engaged, right? And allow them to show up where it makes sense for them within their journey. Uh, activity can also include uh, customer journey mapping, right? So really figuring out from an advocacy perspective, how and when do you engage with customers? And some of it is simple communication. So what's that onboarding experience look like? There's also moments when you might want to delight a customer. So it's like gifting and anniversaries and various things as well. And then obviously supporting kind of renewal. So that tie kind of ties into the activity piece as well. And I would also say uh, that as much as it's your own activity, it's also aligning around where am I collaborating with other marketing teams, right? And so we talked a lot about demand, for example. So activity could also be mobilizing customers to do webinars or videos or whatever else it could be, right? So that's the activity layer. So you've got readiness, activity, and then results. And this is why it's really important to identify identify your North Star, right? If your main responsibility is to help the marketing team influence pipeline, then you've got to have results that are tied to that, right? So it, again, it could be that you've mobilized an X number of advocates to go and help you at a certain trade show or through a certain program. Or it might be that you've actually got a whole series of videos that you've done that have been broken down into different assets for social or demand, right? And so in that respect, when you start to think about results, it's not just about the customer advocacy results. It's also, again, tying into What are the results for the web team? What are the results for the content team? What are the results for the digital team? So when you think about, are we driving uh, a greater uh, traffic to our website? How long are people staying in a session and actually spending time looking at information? It also ties other folks' metrics into your metrics as well. So you can see the broader impact of customer advocacy, not only across the business, but across the marketing portfolio as well. So we talked about readiness. We've talked about activity, we talked about results, and then the final thing is impact. And and for me, that comes back to tying into that North Star and whether that's influence pipeline, whether that's a set number of top accounts that you've influenced through ABM and revenue, et cetera, it's all tying back in, but you've got to be able to track that through Salesforce, et cetera, whatever other CRM you use. You have to be able to tie into the way that the business is reporting metrics uh, and that it aligns and that it passes a sniff test fundamentally as well. That's such a good point. And honestly, one of my takeaways from that is like, sometimes it's easier to align with the North Star if you maybe shrink the scope of what you're trying to attempt. And it's like, whether, you know, if you're a customer marketer and you're getting pushback on, you know, ROI aspects, 
of the program. You know, maybe it sometimes could be as simple as like, just drop what you're getting pushback on, double down on what aligns with the North Star. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah. And let me tell you, you know, by nature, I think a lot of people in customer marketing, and customer advocacy are super intellectually curious, right? We like to have our hands in lots of different areas of the business, uh, which is great because you learn more, but also detriment because then you end up being spread too thin. I think it's absolutely legitimate to dream big and start small, right? So start focused to your point, Sam, uh, and really understand like, you know, there's only so many, so many hours in a day. There's only so many customers, right, as well. Where can we actually spend the most time and be effective for the business rather than spread so thin across the organization that you feel like you're not able to get any real impact. David, this has been fantastic. Where can uh, folks uh, connect with you or find out more about uh, yourself or Forder? Sure. So I'm um, obviously active on LinkedIn, so you can find me there. And then also uh, david.coates at uh, forter.com as well. Fantastic. Um, all right, folks, that is another episode of the State of Customer Storytelling podcast. We're running low on time, so I'm not going to recap the whole episode, but I really, this is, wow, this is a great one. I might just have to go and re-listen to this right away. Covered so much great stuff there. I uh, definitely encourage you to connect with David, follow him. And until next time, this has been the State of Customer Storytelling.